the subject of this webinar is um, is Silicon Valley real estate in a bubble. With that in mind, uh, let's dive into the presentation itself. I want to ask you this question uh, based on what you have read, based on what you perceive is the market. Do you believe that Silicon Valley real estate is in a bubble? So, as you can see, the question of whether Silicon Valley is in a bubble or not is not a new question. This is an article from June of 2013. And if we take a, a look at this uh, article, uh, which was published in June 13, we see here kind of three bubbles. One was uh, when this, uh, the bubble burst, which is July 2007, where the median price was 738,000. Uh, post the bottom of the market, which was in March of 2009, median prices were about 295. When this article was published back in 2013, the median price in Silicon Valley was 564. Uh, I will touch this question of median price and average price a little bit later and share with you why I believe that this is a little bit misleading. Nevertheless, though, uh, let the, the key difficulty of answering this question, whether Silicon Valley is in a bubble or any asset is in a bubble or not, is the fact that basically there's not, um, there is a question of what is the definition of a bubble? So I researched this subject and, care and found the following definition of a bubble. A bubble is a financial phenomenon characterized by a surge in asset, uh, and that applies to whatever asset class, whether it's stock, real estate, or others, and to a level significantly above its, the fundamental value of that asset. At some point, demand decreases or stagnates while supply increases, resulting in a sharp drop in prices, and the bubble bursts. So as you can see, I've tried to dissect this statement, and number one is the prices, number two is fundamental value, number three is demand, and number four is prices drop. So in the next few uh, 45 minutes or half an hour, we're going to spend time discussing each one of those uh, aspects of that definition. And hopefully, as we go, we're going to have a better clarity in terms of what is the bubble and whether Silicon Valley real estate is actually in a bubble or not. So let's get started. To start, let's understand what, a, it, what are the factors that are impacting real estate market in general. The chart that we are looking at is a chart that was developed by S&P uh, K. Schiller. Uh, this is a national home price index. And the red chart, the red chart, is representing the home price index over a very, uh, since uh, nine, the eight, late 1880s. And what we see here that those prices obviously fluctuate over time. And the dotted line here, next to the 100, is uh, inflation adjusted. So if we're going to focus primarily on the period from the end of Second World War forward, we'll see that obviously there are fluctuations in the prices and there we see some bumps here which we're going to touch a little bit later and we're going to talk about now of what are the factors that are impacting the real estate prices in general so to start with we look we know we understand that uh, interest rate is a, is a major factor obviously that impact the real estate market and that is simply because the fact that the majority of people who buy homes, their homes in Silicon Valley, are using a mortgage. And obviously, the higher the mortgage, the less they can afford buying. So clearly, mortgage is a big factor. And as you can see, in the 80s, we had an incredible inflation of 21%, uh, where it resulted in, a, in an interest rate of about 21%. Currently, the, uh, the rate that we are experiencing in this time is uh, about four percent and that is definitely uh, uh, and obviously depends on your on other factors 
what is the actual rate you're gonna get. The other factor that impacting the real estate market is obviously population, which is basically the demand side. And as you see, uh, the population in the United States until the uh, Second War was growing at some pace. And since the Second World War, we are growing approximately between 0.8% uh, to 1% per year, uh, which means uh, as of December of last year, uh, 328 million people live in the United States, which basically says, uh, according to those numbers, so roughly about 3 million people need new housing each year, which is an enormous amount, a number of people. And obviously that is represent the demand side. The other factor that impacting uh, real estate, uh, uh, home uh, home prices is obviously building costs, which can be from uh, cost of material, concrete, cement, wood, uh, copper, and so on and so forth, uh, labor and so on, and obviously uh, cost of land as well. So we see that also is fluctuated based on the economic condition locally as well as impacted by worldwide supply and demand for those such uh, such material. Um, so now if you look at the home price index, what we see here that uh, back in the 80s we see some increase in prices and after a moderate increase we see a correction, then we see another increase in prices in the late 80s, in the mid 80s, mid early 90s, and another correction. And back in the beginning of the 2000s, we see another increase in prices. And obviously, until the crash of uh, 2007, which didn't result just in a real estate um, a bubble crash, but it actually resulted in a worldwide economical, economic recession. So that's obviously price, the price collapsed dramatically across the US and other part of the world. So the question now is where are we today compared to where we have been uh, back then? So these uh, two charts that I'm gonna share with you in a second uh, shows us the Case-Shiller chart for uh, back at the beginning of this year where we see the housing bubble number one, which uh, they referred to one, the one that uh, basically burst in 2007. Uh, we see in the, across the United States about 27% drop in uh, home prices. And lo, and lo and behold, we are about 8% higher than what we used to be back then. So the question I is really, is housing bubble number two, is, the, is are we heading to a housing bubble number two? Now let's take a look at what are the prices in Silicon Valley, San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, so what we see here, that in the bubble number two, uh, in general prices drop about 30%, while currently in bubble number two, question mark, is that prices are higher by 37%. So based on that assumption alone, I would guess that it's fair to say that uh, that Silicon Valley real estate is in a bubble if that was the only factor that we will be uh, that uh, is under consideration because we definitely see that if we crash here in 2007 while the prices were 37 percent lower than why today then obviously we are in a bubble today but that's only one angle of that and let's uh, dive more into other aspect of that question so some of the question that we have to address is Obviously, if we look at prices and we talk about um, how that behave then and where we are today. So first of all, what we see in this chart is a chart of about uh, 19 years of Santa Clara County uh, home prices. And we see the average price, which is in uh, red, uh, the, I'm sorry, the average, which is in blue and red, which is the median price. And what we see here, that we do have a divergence between the median and average and we'll talk about it in a second but if we look back for a second this is a dot-com crash where silicon valley and detroit were the only uh, states uh, in the united states that actually suffered from downward uh, prices uh, on in real estate and as we can see even though silicon valley had a major uh, correction due to the dot-com crash where we lost almost 250,000 jobs the correction in the prices, both median and average, was not as dramatic as one would expect. Uh, if we look at the financial crisis that started back in 2007, 
and the kind of correction we experienced during that period of time, we see it's a much more dramatic one. And that was not just a Silicon Valley correction, but that was a global economic crisis that uh, spread all over, all, obviously all over the world, all over the United States and so on. And we can see here that we do have a divergence between median and average. And that's simply because in Silicon Valley, on one hand, we have homes that are selling for $500,000. And on the other hand, we have homes that can sell for many, many millions and even tens of, tens of millions of dollars. So in addition, I want to touch the, the mis uh, misinformation that is conveyed by the median and average price. Because unlike K. Schiller, which basically compare home pri the same home prices in different time, median and average prices are basically determined by what is currently sold in the market. And if we look at August 2007, we see that almost 94% of homes that were on the market and sold were uh, above the $500,000 price point. A year later, we see that that number has changed dramatically, that homes under $500,000 were almost 35% of the market, which is almost a five-fold increase compared to the previous year. So basically, the, the explanation for that is that once uh, people who uh, lost their job due to the economic crisis uh, and they could not make the payments, the lower demographic of this area was not able to sustain the mortgage payment and they had to sell the home. And since the house, a market was flooded with home, they, uh, they would basically sell it for the, whatever the price they can get, while the stronger demographics uh, where they did not get the kind of prices they were expecting, they were able to make the payment and continue uh, with that um, uh, conversation, uh, with uh, holding the price, the, holding the home and not selling it actually. So if we look at where we are today compared to those times, so we see that the Sunnyvale, as of uh, end of last year, Sunnyvale median price is uh, 1.8 1, 1 and the kind of household income that it takes to uh, qualify for buying this house under tw with 20% down, 30 year fixed loan, a loan of about 4% when the debt to income ratio is below 43% and so on. So these are the kind of prices that an income that we currently are experiencing in Silicon Valley. So in San Jose from $155,000 household income to Menlo Park, uh, $354,000 uh, of household income requires to buy the median prices. So the question now is given that reality, so, and actually a very interesting point is that we see that uh, in Silicon Valley, the low income is considered $117,000. So in a sense, what we see here that Silicon Valley is uh, literally uh, uh, experiencing level of income that is unheard of uh, in many parts of the country. If we look at the fact that the median income in the United States is somewhere about $50,000. So you see that people make a lot of money here, but obviously it's very expensive to live in Silicon Valley. So now let's take a look. Uh, so the question now is, if that's the kind of money that is required to buy a home in Silicon Valley, what, how many people are really qualified for that? And what is the affordability in Silicon Valley? So what we're looking at right now is the affordability in, in Silicon Valley and in California in general, up to uh, Q4 of 2018, a Q1 number of 2019 will be published in about a month. And uh, once we have it, uh, I can share that information with you. So what we're currently looking at is we're looking at uh, the chart, the affordability chart in San Mateo, affordability chart in Santa Clara County. And affordability in general measures the ratio between the median house price to median income, which given the current cost of capital was 20% down relatively good credit and so on. So what we see here that back in two, just before the crash in 2007, the affordability in say, San Mateo County were about 8%, while the affordability in Santa Clara was about 11%. In the bottom of the market, which was 2009, the top, the most affordable 
uh, homes were in the valley were uh, San Mateo County about 32 percent and, and Santa Clara County 44 percent. So obviously everyone is curious to see so where are we today? Well we see that today we are roughly in San Mateo County about 15 percent and 18 percent in Santa Clara which basically translate to about 15 percent of the population can afford buying the median home in uh, Menlo Park and 18 percent can afford buying the median home price in, Men in Santa Clara County. But that information is also a list a little bit misleading because what we are measuring is not necessarily the people who are currently in the market to buy a home in, in, in these particular counties, but we're measuring the general population median income compared to general to the median uh, price point in this particular area. So that is not exactly a, an accurate uh, depiction of the condition. Uh, and the accurate pr uh, prediction is based on uh, what are the bank requirements of obtaining a loan, which we're going to touch uh, in a little bit later. So, so I'm sure some of you are curious to understand and asking themselves, how come home affordability went up uh, in the last quarter of last year? The answer to that is that, as we can see, interest rate has have dramatically dropped since. So. With, um, with the announcement of the feds that they would no longer increase rate uh, back in December 24, we see that the interest rate have dropped dramatically, which resulted back basically in the, in the affordability uh, going uh, higher. So the question now becomes, so, okay, we know that Silicon Valley is very expensive. We know that uh, people in Silicon Valley are making good money, but how really on the demand side, how many people can afford buying those different homes in Silicon Valley? So we have here uh, data from Joint Venture Silicon Valley, which is uh, each one of you can uh, open that report and look at uh, many different uh, interesting statistics about what's going on in Silicon Valley. Among them, they talk about employment and payment and so on. So, and in our area, they divide it into three tiers. Uh, tier one is defined as the professional, the, the engineers, the lawyers, the doctors, and so on and so forth. And what we see here that roughly about three, uh, almost 350, 375,000 people are deployed in this category of tier one. So the question is, in terms of income, what is the median wages uh, for tier one? And among those 375, 350, 375,000 uh, people employed on this tier one category, we see that the median price is about approximately $115,000, which means that half of them making that kind of money uh, and half of them making more. If we look at household income, because particularly in our area, we have um, a lot of household where both husband and wife are working. And what we see here that uh, about 26% of household in Silicon Valley are making over 200,000. And if we, re if we look um, at how many, how many, what was the uh, median price and, uh, and we see that 26% of them are making over $200,000. So we start to get a feeling that there are enough people in this area that are making enough money that they can afford the kind of payment. On top of that, if we look at how much disposable income those people have, well, we see again from the Silicon Valley Joint Venture Study that first of all, between 2015 and 17, their disposable income went up. And there are about roughly about 17% of people who have at least $500,000 of investable asset that they can use for the down payment, can be cash, can be stocks, whatever you want to um, uh, consider. So basically, the objective of this RM few last slide is to actually share with you that there is enough critical mass of people who are making uh, very decent wages 
as well as they have a decent down payment to buy the kind of home that they want to buy in Silicon Valley. So, uh, so let's go to the next bullet, significantly above the fundamental value of an asset. This one really is a hard one. It's a tough question. Significantly above the fundamental value of an asset. And here is the problem. Uh, the problem with this simple statement is that bubbles are very often hard to detect because there is a broad disagreement over the fundamental value of an asset, how to measure its fair market value. This is a very simple question, but the answer to that is not trivial at all. So what? let's try to answer this question. So in a free market, how one determines the fundamental value of a house? Okay, we are now talking about homes, so this is the relevant asset class that we're talking about. So how does one determine what is a free, uh, what is the fair market value of a house? So when you are a cash buyer, when you're buying a home, so whatever a buyer is willing and able to pay, that's that's uh, that's his own the buyer discretionary. They're going to decide what it's worth for them, and that's it. When we use a mortgage, there is another player here, and the player is a bank, and the bank basically. Uh, lends you money and he uses the house as a collateral and as a collateral they have to determine whether it's um, there is enough uh, equity in the house in the event that the buyer defaults so and and basically i don't know of any other way that you can determine what is the fair uh, fundamental value of an uh, asset if you guys have any ideas Please share them with us. We'll appreciate it. And, and in general, a market exists whenever there is a disagreement of our, over the fundamental and the future value of an asset. Uh, under normal circumstances, when somebody is not pressed to, uh, to sell or and is not leaving the area, when we talk about homes in general, then basically, uh, if one sells it because he believes that maybe he has enough equity or he won't diverge or whatever, but he believes that he have, um, uh, there is a diminishing return from his perspective, while others believe that the future uh, is, is positive and they basically jump into the market. So a, a market exists only when there is a, a disagreement about a, a fundamental value as well as future value of a particular asset. And obviously there are other needs that has to be taken into uh, account as well, but this is kind of a philosophical question and I will leave it with that. And if you guys want to share with me, what is your belief, um, then I will definitely appreciate that. So uh, the fundamental question is one of the most difficult questions to answer. And I don't know if that uh, is, if you are satisfied with the answer, but it is, uh, that's my understanding at this time. So let's talk about the third point. Demand decreases or stagnates while supply increases. So what we're seeing here, we're seeing here a chart of, again, 19 years of Silicon Valley, Santa Clara County chart that shows us supply versus demand. The blue is the supply and the red is the demand. And if we can look over a long period of time, we see that roughly the demands, I would say the moving average of the demand is probably about 1,000 homes per month. And when we look at the inventory level, we see a few things. To start with, this is, this is the 2001 dot-com crash, where we had almost four, five homes for every potential buyer. And we see here a dip in the uh, in the demand state. So here we see roughly about five homes per buyer, per buyer. Here in the economic crisis of 2007, we see almost seven and a half homes for every buyer. So obviously they, this is a very much a buyer market. This is very much a buyer market. Anytime there is a, such a discrepancy between supply and demand, obviously it changes. So what are we going to look at now is a few trends in the market. We will see, first of all, that the market has two cycles. One is the seasonality of the cycle, 
where always the bottom is December, uh, November, December, January. The top of the market is typically June, July, August, and so on and so forth. So even though we see increase in the, uh, in the uh, supply, we still see the demand, this, the, the behavior, the seasonality of the market. Uh, the other cycle that we're referring to is what I call the, the economic cycles. And that is basically the uh, cycle of when we had the dot-com crash, a high increase in inventory, and inventory drops uh, toward the uh, 2005. In 2005, we see another increase in inventory uh, and again a correction. And look where we are today, where we still maintain the same seasonality of the cycle, but the relationship between supply and demand, it's much more tighter than we have seen for quite some time. If we now project that to prices, what happened to prices during those time? So what we see here, as we indicated earlier, that even though we had a, a major uh, uh, supply, uh, access supply here, prices in Silicon Valley have not dropped dramatically compared to what we see here, uh, where we have the economic crisis, we see that major drop. And as we discussed earlier, uh, we have to be very careful when we look at median and average and look at the mix, because by the end of the day, the price that really matters is the price where you want to buy in what neighborhood, and what area, what type of house, and so on. So that is very important to watch the impact of inventory and prices as we see here and as we see in this area. Okay. Another point that I want to bring to uh, you to your attention is that if you look at the cycle of the price, that most of the appreciation uh, happens in the Q1 and Q2. So you see this is the beginning of the year, prices goes up, then stay flat, prices go up, then stays flat, and so on. So most of the appreciation typically happens when inventory levels are low. If you look at that, inventory level are low, then leveling, when inventory are going up, prices getting flat. And that's a very classical behavior of supply and demand. Good. Another thing that I want to show you is the, four, the, the fourth point which is basically a sharp drop in prices, okay? So if we look at here, I picked up two places, uh, Palo Alto and Sunnyvale, and what we see here that uh, this is a kind of a 12 months uh, perspective. We do see some flag, uh, price uh, fluctuation, as we see this is the beginning of the year, uh, prices go and every different city behave differently, depends on what's currently on the market, and so on and so forth. And we see also a price fluctuation in Sunnyvale as well, where we see the green being the average price and the median price is, uh, is blue, basically. And when we look at uh, another relationship, uh, a lighter relationship, we look at uh, what's called buyer's market versus seller's market. So obviously, this is the period of the economic crisis where clearly we were in a buyer's market. And as of 2012, uh, we see that we have dropped into the seller market. And we have been in the seller market since roughly 2012. Obviously, what we see here, interestingly enough, is that was there was a little bit of a change, a change where it market was heading to a buyer market, what was the interest rate um, announcement of the feds and so at that time we see a drop back into the seller market and that's also being reflected in the prices so if we look at the relationship between sales price to list price this is basically the 100 percent where uh, sales price equal lease price we see that during that period, since being in the seller market in 2012, prices typically uh, were above asking price because we had limited supply and the demand was over the supply. And again, look at the seasonality of the market with prices going up in the beginning of the year, dropping, going up in the beginning of the year and dropping. And again, if we look here at this time where we definitely saw the start the correction of the market uh, starting in um, uh, second half of last year. If we look here, 
we see an increase here. Basically, back prices start to hedge up higher compared to what they were. So this is where we are today. So what I want to do now is basically we are now uh, about uh, it's 11:40, and I am. I want to now review some of the points that we brought up with the conversation. So what is the definition of a bubble? We talked about the asset prices. We talk about the fundamental value. We talk about demand versus supply. And we talk about sharp drop in prices. So in my point of view, when we look at this definition and look at each one of those elements that make the definition, in my opinion, we are not in a bubble, okay? But let me bring another perspective to this conversation, and that is a conversation, a perspective of uh, Robert Schiller. Uh, some of you might have heard about Robert Schiller. Robert Schiller is a, a Yale prof a professor for to, uh, to economics in Yale University. He won the Nobel Prize for predicting the uh, dot-com crash as well as the real estate crash. And uh, Robert Schiller was asked back in 2010 um, he, for his definition of what is a bubble. And he basically have a bicycle, about eight categories of for to, to, his de, to his definition of how to spot a bubble. So a sharp increase in the price of an asset like a real estate and or shares. So we do see a sharp increase and nobody argues that. We clearly see that. A great public excitement about the said increase. There is conversation, there is the star discussion, but anyone who can remember the 2007 crash, uh, the kind of conversation that we hear today in the media and, and so on is by far not even close to that. There are conversations, they're more concerned there rather than excitement about it. And the accompanying media frenzy, as I touch, I don't see that much of that. There is conversation mostly concern rather than frenzy about this top to top. Stories of people that are earning a lot of money causing envy, I don't see that because in our area typically you don't see a lot of flippers. You see some and I can share with you some stories about recent flippers that actually lost a lot of money. So we people don't buy here, typically um, the people, the homeowners who work in Silicon Valley and see that is their home, they don't buy homes to flip, they buy home to live in it, to be next to good schools and so on, and, uh, and obviously have family life and so on. A growing interest in the asset class among general public, uh, I would not say that. Anyone who of you have seen the movie The Big Short and remember stories about people buying, uh, you know, five, ten homes, uh, and people who are where I think one of the stories in Florida was that a stripper bought uh, 10 homes. I would encourage you to read the book, The Big Short. It gives you a good perspective of really what happened and what went wrong. So I don't see a lot of that. New era stories about uh, justifying unprecedented price, I do not see that at all. Uh, a decline in lending standard, I absolutely do not see that either. So according to um, Kay Schiller, uh, Robert Schiller, definition, I do not see signs of a bubble. There is another, uh, um, uh, Freddie Mac is also has uh, another guidelines of how to spot the bubble. And they have a two-step process. Uh, is the number one, uh, using a price to income ratio uh, to spot the markets out of bound. So basically we see that in Silicon Valley right now, as we indicated before, in Santa Clara, we have about 18%, um, and in San Mateo, we have about 14%. So these are low, not as much as we saw in 2007, and as well as I indicated earlier, this is something which is a little bit distorted. So that is something that you want to keep in mind. And the second step they, where they look at that, they ask those uh, three questions. Number one, are there a non-financial reason for the high PTI, price to index ratio. Is there a rapid growth in a geographically specific industry that explains the current PTI, okay? And clearly in Silicon Valley, we see an area that is growing rapidly, an area that is attracting a lot of high um, people with uh, high education, high income, high household income, 
And as far as I can tell right now, I don't see any signs for slowdown. So basically, we have a good uh, geographical uh, concentration of an industry here that attracts a lot of highly educated people who have a lot of money. The second thing, the second question that has to be asked, are credit conditions deteriorating? And I can tell you, as someone who has done a lot of uh, uh, loans, and I do have some cash clients as well, but a lot of majority of my clients, I would say 90% of my clients are cash, uh, are mortgage buyers. And I can tell you, banks are very, very tough. They look at you, your credit, your income, your FICO score, debt to income ratio, and so on. And the lending criteria that we are experiencing today is no nothing near or close to what was back in uh, between 2001 to 2007. Nothing to compare. The third point is leverage. Again, I do not see an in increased level of uh, leverages. I do not see that. Um, banks would, do not, would not lend you money if they cannot prove your financial stability, your down payment, your income, your FICO score, the debt income, and all those kind of criteria. So in my humble opinion, based on both the, the data that we looked at, based on the criteria by Robert Schiller and Freddie Mac, I personally do not see a bubble. Taking a few seconds and talk about ourselves. Um, I'm doing uh, professionally uh, real estate since uh, March of 2005. So it's uh, literally um, uh, almost uh, 14 day, uh, years of being directly involved in many aspects of real estate. Um, in our, we also extended, ex, expanded our team. We have Nati, Ella, Asaf, and Amit, and they are all realtors. Um, and Nati is focused on real estate investing out of Silicon Valley. Ella and Asaf are focused on residential real estate in Silicon Valley. And Amit, who uh, is uh, doing commercial real estate, uh, acts as a capacity, in a capacity of advisor and commercial real estate as we look uh, both in locally as well as outside of the area. As far as myself, I've been in high tech uh, for over 20 years. Uh, some of the companies that I work for are recognized to you. Some do no longer exist. Um, in addition, I've been a founder of three high tech startup. Uh, anyone who wants to read more about that background can go to my LinkedIn profile and we'll find the details over there. Um, as far as the um, real estate goes. My wife and I, who arrived to Silicon Valley in 1985, where um, we have done many transactions prior to becoming professional real estate, uh, involving professionally in real estate, uh, been buying homes in Silicon Valley as well as investing across the country. Uh, investing is something which is I'm very passionate about, and we'll we have a seminar which I'm going to touch in a few minutes. Um, as far as our career uh, accomplishment as uh, professional realtors, uh, we are um, very proud of the fact that a lot of our clients really uh, appreciate our service. Uh, our um, we believe in what's called holistic uh, real estate uh, realtor services, which does versus a, tra a transactional one, where we provide a variety of services along the entire life cycle of real estate ownership. Uh, these presentations are loaded with information about uh, what happened in the market, uh, what are the reasons, strategic reasons to buy or not to buy a home in Silicon Valley, uh, timing of buying, how to buy, what to buy, and so many, a lot of information. 